Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about how to read an ECG in your emergency room. So, you all know that ECG is one of the important tool in emergency room. So, sometimes we will have to take ECG, we will have to see whether it is taken correctly or not. Then you have to interpret the ECG and depending on the clinical scenario, you have to make a diagnosis. Interpretation of ECG is one part and you have to correlate with that with your clinical finding then only you can make a diagnosis so that is very important so you can see here uh, we are connecting uh, uh, chest leads here one two three four five six chest leads on the chest and we are also connecting limbs limb leads the green will go to the right lower limb red will go to the left lower limb and uh, that will be written upper uh, Black will be on the upper left arm, uh, white will be on the upper right arm. So, these are the normal connections done to take an ECG. The problem with this is if you are interchanging the leads, the limb leads, then the total ECG can sometimes can be wrong. So, that we have to make sure that all the leads including the limb leads are connected properly according to this scheme. Now, when you are taking an ECG, you get a 12 lead ECG. First of all, you have to see the standardization in ECG. So, all these things are standardization. You can see here the height of this standardization will be 10 small squares, width of this will be 5 small squares. So, that is a standardization. Suppose the standardization is smaller, then there will be problem. If it is larger, again it will become problematic or the uh, format is uh, uh, like uh, distorted again you can have problems so standardization is the most important thing you have to see in ACG so normal standardization height is 10 small squares and 5 small squares width then next thing is AVR all complexes in AVR has to be negative because we are connecting right uh, uh, that uh, lead limb leads on the right side the electrical activity so this is your upper limb and the electrical activity is always going away from this vector. So, that is why all complexes in AVR will be negative. So, two important things you have seen one is standardization. Second thing is the AVR. Every complex in A AVR has to be negative. Then that is also normally taken ECG. I am not take, going to the abnormal ECGs at present because I have already told you that there is a problem if you interchange the upper limb leads then again this can be distorted so we are not discussing that now that we will discuss some other time ok. Now how these ECGs are uh, organized the, uh, the uh, leads are organized you have to see this is 1 and AVL that green color 1 and AVL and V5, V6 all faces the heart on the left side left upper limb and last two leads E5, V6, they all see the left part of the heart or lateral part of the heart. So, they are called as lateral leads 1 AVL V5, V6. Whereas 2, 3 AVF you see this F, F is for foot. So, foot faces the heart from the lower part and lower part of the heart will be uh, shown in that vector. Okay. So, 2, 3 AVF always uh, reflect the changes in the inferior wall of the heart ok. Again V1, V2, V3 we already seen that on the chest. So, suppose this is the chest of the patient V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 that we have seen. So, V1 to V6 is always on the anterior part V1, V2 is septal, uh, V3, V4 is anterior and V5, V6 is lateral ok. So, like this, this ECG uh, ECG uh, uh, is uh, organized into various groups. So, AVR is right sided uh, lead, 1 AVL V5, V6 is lateral leads, 2, 3 AVF inferior leads, V1, V2 septal leads, V3, V4 anterior leads. Again, we already seen that V5, V6 is lateral leads. So, whatever changes come in this area. Suppose there is an ST elevation in V1, V2, he 
can diagnose it as a anterior or septal myocardial infarction. If we have ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF, you can make a diagnosis of uh, inferior wall myocardial infarction. Now, we have to see the speed of the ECG paper in the ECG machine. So, paper speed is 25 millimeter per second. Each small square that, uh, that goes in the machine with a speed of 0 0.04 second. So, that is very important 0 0.04 second. One larger square, one big square that is 5 millimeters, 5 small squares. 0.2 seconds it crosses the ECG machine. 5 big squares that is 25 millimeter, 1, 1 second it takes 1 second. 30 big squares are 6 seconds. Height of 1 big square is 0.5 millivolts. All these things are, may be useful in uh, when you have a machine which is not having uh, the proper readings or writing. Old type of machines, all these things are very, very important. But newer machines, that itself will give all the parameters printed on the ECG paper. But however, when we are reading, when we are learning the ECG, all these things are very, very important. Now, about conduction system, we have already learned this in your physiology class. We have a, a normal conduction system in our heart that is a self-generated, current-generated part that is SA node. It can generate current in your heart. From SA node, the current will go to the AB node. So, you can see here, it goes to the AB node. From AB node, it will go to the bundle. So, bundle from there, left bundle and right bundle. Okay. So, that is a normal conduction of your heart. So, how this conduction is reflected in, e in your ECG that you should understand and what are the waves, waves produced during this conduction also you should know. So, this P wave is produced due to atrial depolarization that starts from the SA node. So, when the SA node, SA node produces current, the P waves are formed. So, that is very important. Then the time taken from the SA node to AV node, that is this PR interval. So, SA node to AV node, this current will travel, that is a PR interval. So, onset of P to onset of R. So, that is PR interval. Then first negative deflection is always a Q wave, but most of the ECGs you may not see the Q wave. Q waves are properly seen when there is a myocardial infarction. So, that we will discuss afterwards. But whatever it is, QRS complex is the next one. So, QRS complex is actually produced during the ventricular conduction. That is because of ventricular depolarization. So, that is QRS complex. You can see here QRS complex. Now, next is ventricular repolarization. That is this P wave, U wave, all these things. So, normally current starts in the SA node. From there, current SA node to AV node current travels, from AV node it will go to the bundle. So, here P wave will be formed, PR interval will be formed, in the ventricle you get QRS complex. So, that is a conduction of your heart. Now, waves in ECG, you have P wave, you have R wave, you have T wave, you have U wave. So, P wave is produced by atrial depolarization. QRS is produced by ventricular depolarization and T waves are uh, or ST segment is produced by ventricular repolarization. Okay. And you have some segments or intervals. PR interval is from the onset of P to onset of QRS. QT interval is from Q to T uh, wave. So, that is also uh, sometimes which may be useful in your clinical practice. Now, there is a rhythm strip in your ECG. You can see every ECG on the lowermost part. These are the 12 leads we are seeing already. Uh, this is the left oriented leads, inferior, inferior leads, anterior leads, septal, anterior, then lateral leads. But there is another strip on the lowermost part of the ECG that is called as rhythm strip. The importance of rhythm strip is it is almost always taken from the lead to and you can see the P waves properly in this. That is the advantage of taking lead to as a rhythm strip. 
So to know the rhythm, you need to see the P wave properly. You need to see the QRS complex properly and you need to get all the complexes properly. So one lead which can show all these things are lead 2. That is why we take rhythm strip as lead 2 and some ECG machines you can change that to V1 also. Only thing V1 P wave morphology is slightly different. It is like this P1 P wave morphology is like this biphasic P waves are seen in V1 but whereas in lead 2 it is monophasic P wave. Now, what is normal sinus rhythm? When you are seeing the pulse, we always tell patient is having normal pulse, he is in normal sinus rhythm. But ECG wise, to tell normal sinus rhythm, you should have a P wave, proper P wave. That means SA node is producing current. From then, you need to have a proper PR interval. So, current has to travel to AB node. Then, you should have a QRS complex. So, conduction is happened here. Complete conduction is happened. So, that is single complex and every time that has to repeat. Okay. So, again conduction should happen and it will go to the ventricle. So, this RR interval should be equal. That is also very important. So, according to ECG uh, reading, to tell that patient is having sinus rhythm, you need to have a regular P wave. You need to have a proper PR interval. I will tell what is proper PR interval afterwards. Then every P wave should follow a QRS complex that means SA node to AB node conduction is there but after that also it should continue. So there is a regular QRS complex and RR interval is always equal. Then you can call the patient is in sinus rhythm. Now how to calculate rate? Most of the newer ECGs will tell you the rate and it will be printed uh, on the top of the ECG paper. But if you know to read the rate in ECG, that will be better. So, you can see here in between two RR interval, there are four large squares. So, this is a large square, next large square, next large square, next large square. So, four large squares are there, 300 by number of large square coming in between two QRS complex will give you the rate. So, that is the easiest method 300 by number of large squares coming in between two QRS complex will give you the rate of the ECG if the rate is regular. If it is irregular then uh, there is another way that will tell afterwards or you can go to this method also that also will give you the rate. Suppose you want more precise rate then you can go for 1500 by number of small squares. That also gives almost similar results. So, no need to try that. You can try this method that is easier method. Now, what is the rate in this ECG? Just apply the previous knowledge. There are 1, 2, 3, 4 and nearly 5. It is not 5. Here it is 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. 300 by 5 that will give 60. So, 60 is the heart rate. So, normally in a ECG if it is the rhythm is regular then everywhere the rate will be same. If the rhythm is irregular then you cannot apply this method. There is another method that will show you. So, here the ECG is in sinus rhythm and the rate is somewhere around 60 beats per minute. Now, if it is irregular then this is not possible. Last one is not possible. So, you can see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 squares is 1 second. Like that you take 6 seconds. How many QRS complex are coming in this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 QRS complex are coming or 8 pulse is generated during this uh, process. This rhythm is totally irregular. So, 8 pulses are or 8 QRS complex are produced in 6 second. So, 60 seconds, 6 seconds it is 8. So, 60 seconds it is 80. So, that will be the rate of ECG. This is a, an ECG of atrial fibrillation. So, here you can calculate like that. No need to worry. Most of the ECGs uh, at present show the rate and rhythm properly and it will be printed on the ECG paper.
you know, there are something called as intrinsic heart rates. So, we have a current generator that is SA node in your heart. If it produces proper uh, electricity, the heart rate will be somewhere around 75 beats per minute. If that is not working, then AV node will take over the function. Its rate will be somewhere around 60 and that is also not working. Then your uh, bundle is, will take care of the uh, function. The rate will be somewhere around 40. Okay, so that happens in complete hard block when a, a SA node is not working, AV node is not working, the current may be generated from the ventricle, the rate may be 40 or less. Okay, normal heart rate in a normal person will be somewhere around 60 to 100. If it is less than 60 or some books say is less than 50 is bradycardia. If it is more than 100, it is tachycardia. If it is very high, more than 140 to 100, you can even tell supraventricular tachycardia. Now, we will see the P wave morphology. Normally, P waves are dome shaped. You can see here P waves are like this. It is produced from the SA node activation and the height will be 0 0.05 to 2.5. 2.5 will be 2 and half divisions. So, height will be 2.5. 5 small squares and width will be uh, you can see here 3 or 2.5, 2.5 small squares. So, height will be 2.5 small squares, width will be 2.5 small squares. If the height is more, it is abnormal and if the width is also more, it is abnormal. Okay. So, two important abnormalities of P wave that we will see afterwards, the height is 2.5 divisions. With this 2.5 divisions, if it is more than that, it is abnormal. P waves are produced from the SA node and it, it, it is best seen in layer 2. Now, these are the two important abnormalities you can see in the P wave. One is P waves are very tall, P pulmonal, and another one is P is wide and there is a notch like M, it is P mitral. Okay. P pulmonal always indicates right atrial enlargement. This indicates left atrial enlargement. Right atrial enlargement is a feature of pulmonary disease and core pulmonal. Core pulmonal is uh, right ventricular dilatation and failure mostly due to a lung disease. This is uh, classically seen in left atrial enlargement is classically seen in mitral stenosis. Okay. So, P pulmonal is a is a modern feature of core pulmonal that is right atrial enlargement. P mitral is a feature of left atrial enlargement that is classically seen in mitral stenosis. Now, if you see the P waves in lead V1 and uh, lead 2 or see this is lead 2 or V1, V1. Both are slightly different. In lead 2, it is only monophasic P, but whereas in lead V1, it is biphasic. So, depending on the uh, prob problem, this can be changed. Okay. So, I am not going to that because it is normally we do not see the V1 for P waves that we will not discuss here. Now, this ECG shows very tall. P waves. So, the, the diagnosis is P pulmonary. Where all we will get? If it is a chronic problem, it is due to COPD, core pulmonary, core pulmonary. If it is an acute problem, then it has to be pulmonary embolism. So, core pulmonary or left, sorry, right atrial enlargement, you can get very tall. P waves. Now, a patient who is having mitral stenosis coming with this ECG change, you can see it is M shaped P wave, it is called as P mitral, it is seen in mitral stenosis. That is because of the left atrial enlargement. Left atrial enlargement can be seen in many other conditions, but easy to remember, I am telling mitral stenosis. It can be due to mitral regurgitation, it can be due to cardiomyopathies, it can be due to hypertensive heart disease. So many conditions also can produce same changes. Now, here 
can you see any p wave so we are not seeing proper p waves the normally from sn node if the current is produced single p wave is produced but in atrial fibrillation instead of single contact, single area multiple areas will produce current so all will send uh, current to the main system and some of the uh, current will be transmitted to ventricle in a random manner so you get a wavy baseline and qrs complex but rr interval will be totally irregular so irregularly irregular rr interval but the important feature is wavy baseline okay so wavy baseline irregularly irregular rr interval is a feature of atrial fibrillation here you are not seeing any p wave that's why that abnormality comes here we are talking about p wave proper p waves are produced from the sn node if the current is single uh, current produced from the sn node if multiple currents are produced from the atrium then it is atrial fibrillation now this is multifocal atrial tachycardia previous one we have seen lots of current produced from the atria around 600 uh, uh, 600 beats are produced from the atria here it is not like that but even then it is from the different areas so one p wave will be like this another p wave will be like this and third one will be like this some may be inverted so multiple morphology of p waves if you are getting that means current is generated from different areas so one may be from here one may be from different area another may be from a different area this may be from inverted and going up so they are uh, the current is produced from the different areas of heart and that has produced tachycardia you can call it as multifocal atrial tachycardia if the rate is low you call it as wandering wandering pacemaker so if the rates are low then it is wandering pacemaker if the rate is high it is multifocal atrial tachycardia this is classically seen in hypoxemia so the important treatment for this is treat the hypoxemia now we can see the next wave that is pr interval so onset of p2 onset of qrs complex is pr interval time taken from the sno to av node so here there are two important problems one you should know the normal uh, range of the pr interval 120 to 200 milliseconds or 3 to 5 small squares if it is wide it is first degree heart block narrow means wp w syndrome that we will see next slides so if pr interval is longer so normally you know that from sno to av node conduction it takes only very short time okay but due to some reason if it is delayed a problem so what happens pr interval will be prolonged so that is called as first degree heart block Whereas in short PR interval, normally SNO to AV node conduction happens and you get a normal PR interval. But here, unfortunately, there is another accessory pathway that is faster than the regular pathway that conducts very fast so that PR interval will be shorter. So that is an accessory pathway which is faster than the regular pathway. So here you can see the accessory pathway. So instead of going like this, it comes like this. So that is faster. So this is called as uh, one of the uh, accessory pathway condition is called as Wolf Parkinson White syndrome or WP W syndrome. Here you can see the PR interval is very short. Now you can see here ECG the PR interval is larger. We can call it as first degree heart block. Now here you can see what you are seeing is. PR interval is shorter that may be due to WPW syndrome. Now here you can see different types of abnormalities in rate the normal ECG first one here the rate is faster like 300 by 2 rate will be 150 but RR interval is all RR intervals are equal whereas here RR intervals are irregular. So this is narrow complex that means qrs complex is not wide and regular but here it is narrow complex it is irregular so that is atrial fibrillation now here it is wide so wide qrs complex but it is regular here it is wide qrs complex it is irregular so 
According to ACLS, we will be classifying the tecti arrhythmias like this. Narrow complex regular, it will be mostly SVT. Narrow complex irregular, it will be mostly atrial fibrillation. Wide complex regular, it can be due to VT, it can be due to SVT with LBVB, SVT with RBVB, SVT with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Here it is irregular, mostly it is due to torsed is D point is or VF. And here you can see bradyarrhythmias. Bradycardia means the heart rate is low. Different types of heart blocks also can reduce the bradycardia. Here first degree heart block we are seeing prolonged uh, PR interval. Second degree heart block of its type 1 that you can see PR interval is progressively prolonging and suddenly you are missing one QRS complex. Of its type 2, PR interval is fixed and suddenly you are pick, uh, dropping one QRS complex. And third degree heart block, P waves come regularly, but QRS complex is coming its own rate. Okay, so P waves are coming regularly, QRS complex are regularly coming, but there is no association between P and QRS complex. That means complete dissociation from atria to ventricle. That is third degree heart block. All these conditions also can produce bradycardia. Now, when you are diagnosing tachyarrhythmia, this algorithm will be helpful to make a diagnosis. So, first of all, you have to see whether the QRS complex is narrow, that is less than 3 small squares or wide. So, first of all, see that whether it is narrow or wide. Second thing is whether it is regular or irregular. So, both things are very important. Now, QRS complex, the normal width of the QRS complex we have already seen, it is less than 120 milliseconds, that is 3 small squares. Normal. If, if it is like that, you call it as narrow complex. Suppose it is more than 3 small squares, it is like this, then it is wide QRS complex. Now, you can see here, the QRS complex in first one is uh, less than 0 0.08 seconds, so it is less than 2 squares, it is normal. Second one is at the brim of uh, that wide QRS complex, 0.12 seconds or 3 small squares, but third one, it is very, very wide. So you can see here, it is wide. From here to here, it is more than 3 squares, so it is wide QRS complex. Now, oh, LBVB and RBVB both can produce wide QRS complex. The typical pattern you have to follow in V1 R S R dash pattern R S R dash pattern will produce RBBB whereas a wide notched or M shaped QRS complex with following ST depression T wave inversion can produce that can produce an LBVB change. Sometimes instead of M pattern it will be W pattern and ST will be up. Okay, that also will tell you that patient may have LBV. Most of the time RBVB is innocent problem that will not produce any major problem in the heart, but LBVB is always pathological. Most of the time it indicates ischemic heart disease. Acute LBVB should be considered as myocardial infarction. Now, Q waves. The last wave in ECG may be the last important wave. There is another wave that we will see afterwards the, that the Q wave. So, normally when you when the vector, the vector means the connection uh, on the chest or upper limb, lower limb. So, whenever that sees the heart, that produces a positive deflection. So, even if you see the Q wave, you get a very small Q wave in ECG. But when it is infarcted so after myocardial infarction, that part will die, then that will produce a negative window, you get a large Q wave. So, first we Q wave is, if it is larger in multiple dates, you should understand this, that the patient might have developed an acute myocardial infarction, following that the, the patient is not thrombolized properly and patient had developed acute infarction and necrosis of the myocardial tissue, tissue. that is why he is developing Q waves. 
So Q valves are classically seen in myocardial infarction. There is a post myocardial infarction change. After the acute event, patient can develop a significant Q valve if you are not thrombolyzing properly or if you are not taking the patient for any revascularization, revascularization treatment. Now, ST segment is produced by the ventricular systole and you can see the ST segment. Normally, it is like this. This is your PR segment and you have QRS complex. This ST segment should fall on the PR segment. So, if you draw a line like this, it should fall on the PR segment. If that is lower than PR segment, it is ST depression. If that is higher than the PR segment, then it is ST elevation. You know, ST elevation mostly, whenever you see ST elevation, you have to always remember that that may be myocardial infarction. There are some other reasons also for ST elevation. But in a normal MBBS teaching, if you are seeing an ST elevation with chest pain, then it is mostly myocardial infarction. Okay, so you can see here different types of ST elevation. But ultimately, it will come down and eventually it may come to normal. But by the time, if you don't thrombolize by the uh, like the 3 4 hours, the patient develops a significant cure that can also happen. So, ST elevation always indicated indicative of myocardial infarction. Now, ST depression, you can see here different types of ST depression. There is down sloping ST depression, there is up sloping ST depression, there is a flat ST depression. In that flat is most important type of ST depression. So, that is a sign of ischemic heart disease, where, but there are other conditions also can produce ST depression including LBVB, RBVB, ectopics like ventricular premature complex, cardiomyopathy, digoxin effect. All these things can be a reason for ST depression. Now T waves, uh, the T waves are normally upright and it is taller. But if uh, it is produced by ventricular free wall polarization, if that is very tall, then it is a significant problem. It can be due to hyperacute MI. Patients who is having hyperkalemia also can have universal tall T waves. If all, all leads, if you are seeing tall T waves, then it is due to hyperkalemia. But only few leads, if you are seeing, it is due to hyperacute myocardial infarction. LVH with diastolic strain, you can get large T wave and sometimes normal variant also, you can get tall T wave. A deeply inverted T wave, again, that can also produce uh, produced due to ischemic change. A symmetrical T wave inversion, symmetrical means some patients you can see a symmetrical T wave inversion. But here, what you are seeing is a symmetrical, both limbs are same. Okay, that is a symmetrical T wave always indicates ischemic heart disease. So, we have discussed about a normal ECG. Normal ECG will show a P wave, P wave is produced from the SA node, there is a PR interval, then the QRS complex, QRS complex is produced from the AV node and afterwards. Depending on the changes in that leads, we have told about common changes, we did not discuss about the uh, abnormal abnormality seen in various uh, conditions. Common changes what we see in emergency room only we have discussed now. We will be uh, learning uh, other things in different classes. So, whatever we have told is how to analyze a normal ECG with its normal waves and some common abnormalities. Thank you.